Muscle length has been a massive topic of debate in the strength and hypertrophy field recently. Specifically, a handful of studies have been published over the last few years suggesting that biasing longer muscle lengths can lead to greater hypertrophy. Now, some are very convinced by this, and at this point may be even training exclusively with longer muscle lengths, whereas others think that some of the limitations of the current research, such as the training status of the subjects used in these studies, the duration of these studies, ultimately make the conclusions misleading, and they hold the position that longer muscle length training is not necessarily better. Now, to make sure we're on the same page, when I say longer muscle length training, I mean one or ideally both of the following. So first is that the target muscle is exposed to a longer length. And second, the longer length is where the point of peak difficulty is. In other words, the most challenging part of the range of motion is at a long muscle length. Personally, I'm relatively convinced of this body of research and I'd hedge my bets towards longer muscle lengths being superior for maximizing the hypertrophy of a given set. Now, this video isn't meant to be a full research review of muscle length data, but we can definitely do that in a future video if you would like. So please comment down below if you'd like to see that. Now, in terms of a brief overview of the studies that have shifted me in this direction over time, I'll point out a 2013 study from Bloomquist, a 2021 and 2023 study from Mayo, a 2021 study from Zabaleta Corta, a 2022 study from Pedrosa, a 2023 study from Kinoshita, a 2023 study from Cassiano, and finally a recent 2024 study from Larson and colleagues. All of these listed studies lean in favor of longer muscle lengths. Now, with that said, there's, of course, plenty of uncertainty in the research, and some studies do show no difference, such as a 2014 study from McMahon, a 2018 study from Stasanaki, and a 2020 study from Nunez. These studies employed a range of designs, but when we take a step back, what's most interesting to me in this whole muscle length debate is whether range of motion itself is a variable that's worth prioritizing. In other words, there was a time in the field when it was quote unquote common knowledge that it's preferable to train through a longer range of motion. However, we have multiple studies now that report equal or greater growth when training through a shorter range of motion, especially when it's at the lengthened position. Now, I'm not proposing that this applies on the extremes, such as using no range of motion, like in an isometric contraction, there's probably a necessary amount of range of motion that must occur. But my opinion is that the current data suggests that we don't need to maximize range of motion at all costs. In fact, we even see meaningful muscle growth from those isometrics. Again, that is an extreme example, but it's interesting that we still see meaningful hypertrophy in isometrics. Because in an isometric, you have effectively zero range of motion because you're just pushing against an immovable implement. While on one hand, I'm a scientist and I look to evaluate the literature, I also coach people interested in getting as strong and or as jacked as possible. So instead of directly applying the latest study findings, I approach the research looking for concepts and idea fuel in order to problem solve clients programming. So I'm going to give you a few examples of longer muscle length training I've implemented with my clients lately. And I'm again, focusing on this concept that range of motion as an independent variable does not seem to drive adaptations, but instead exposure to longer muscle lengths and putting a lot of tension, a lot of stimulus, and ideally the point of peak difficulty at that longer muscle length. I'm gonna work through three recent use cases of this concept that I've come across. So first is adding variety when training in a garage gym or a similar bare bones gym with little machines, little equipment. Now variation in variables like exercise selection and rep ranges do seem to have some support for improving strength and hypertrophy. Whereas variation in range of motion itself has very little direct evidence. However, it does seem that the benefits of longer muscle length training are site specific. So what I mean by that is if we take the biceps, for example, the distal region of the muscle seems to benefit more. And the distal region in the biceps as our example is further away from the shoulder. Whereas the proximal site or further up your arm in the biceps 
Any differences between longer muscle length training and short muscle length training seem to be much smaller. And subjectively, shorter muscle length training is less fatiguing. So if you quote unquote fatigue match shorter muscle length training with longer muscle length training, leading to more sets or more volume with shorter muscle length training, perhaps you could get a slight benefit to proximal growth. Now I'm speculating here, we don't have a ton of direct evidence on that, but it might be that some variation in the muscle length bias of a program has a slight benefit to overall hypertrophy. But either way, psychologically, a lot of lifters seem to enjoy less redundancy in their programs. And if they don't have a lot of equipment, they can simply use a combination of maybe full range of motion, lengthened bias training, and you could even sprinkle in some shortened bias training. For example, I have a couple of clients that train in a garage gym and they have a pulley machine that attaches to their rack. So they don't have a ton of equipment access, a ton of machine access, but they do have a nice option for cable tricep pushdowns. Now, we could do cable tricep pushdowns multiple times a week, or we could add some tricep variety by doing lengthened partials on one day and full range of motion on the other day. The second use case is strategically managing the fatigue of a movement. Now, if we take a step back, in my opinion, lengthened partials or just doing the lengthened half of the range of motion are going to be most effective when you can use a greater load compared to full range of motion. So for example, if you can use say 40% more load when doing a lengthened partial on a lat pull down, which is hardest at the bottom or the shortened position, that's going to be more effective than say changing a leg press to a lengthened partial. And that's because leg press is already hardest at that bottom position where the quads are lengthened. In fact, leg press lengthened partials may actually require you to use less load compared to full range of motion because you don't have that sort of mini break between reps. So for that reason, I don't program lengthened partials on exercises like leg press all that often where it's already hardest at the bottom or that lengthened position. But it can be a helpful tool if you actually want to reduce the load. So for example, I've had some clients prepping for powerlifting meets while also managing aches and pains. So something like lengthened partials on leg press or another example is Romanian deadlifts has come in really handy to challenge the target muscle with less external load and what also seems to be like less fatigue and less likely to kind of trigger those aches and pains. Finally, the third use case that I found helpful in client troubleshooting using some of these concepts from the research is troubleshooting the feel of an exercise. So one that I've come across recently a couple times is not really feeling the pecs as the limiting factor in pressing exercises like machine chest press. However, this could be due to the top half of the movement being so hard for the triceps that the triceps fatigue first, and then that's kind of what limits you in that exercise, and thus the pecs don't feel like they're being pushed hard from a machine chest press. So instead, you can just do lengthened partials on them and just do the bottom half. And this can turn a bad machine for that individual into a phenomenal one for the muscle that you're looking to target. All right, there you have it. A few use cases of length and bias training. And just overall, instead of having a myopic view of length and bias training as good or length, as, length and bias training as bad, I think a good coach will understand the potential benefits conceptually and put the pieces together to make the best programming decisions on a case by case basis. If you made it this far in the video, we'd be honored if you liked the video and subscribed. And if you think you're subscribed, please just go ahead and double check that you are. And if you want to support the channel, check out our coaching and programming options in the description below, all from active researchers in the field. And we also have a low cost programming option called infinity programs, as well as premium one-on-one -on -one coaching.